creative yet jealous out there what is good Jacob back here with you for another edition of the improvisers guide to the cello lick of the week series and today I'm gonna to be checking out a brand new cellist or at least I had never heard of him before uh, named Svante Henrizen uh, all the way from Denmark a couple of you guys uh, sent me this video um, so this particular edition is by request first of all he's playing over night and day which is I think the first jazz tune I ever learned, probably the easiest jazz changes you can imagine. It's all in C major. So it's probably a tune that all of you guys, if you're interested in jazz and watching this video, already know. As you can hear, Henryson's overall soloing and jazz vocabulary is extremely rudimentary compared to any other jazz instrumentalist. But it's always a minor miracle to hear a cello player soloing on anything remotely jazzy in a coherent way. And, and the fact that his playing is so clear makes a solo like this a great resource for aspiring jazz cellists. So what I'd like to do today is break down the three basic concepts that Henryson is using to solo through this entire tune. These are tools that every jazz improviser has in their tool belt but studying them through a cellist lens is gonna make it even more valuable for you guys. All three of these ideas are laid out and repeated by Henryzen over and over again during the course of his solo in an extremely cello-friendly way. And by the end of this lesson, a lot of you guys are gonna be able to solo in this jazz cocktail style using these concepts without any problem at all. So. Let's get started. For those of you that have seen my other videos, you know that one of the first things I do when examining a solo and trying to more deeply understand a player's style is I look for repetition. In other words, spots in the soloist's playing where they've repeated the same lick, idea, or concept over and over again. Often this will even happen in the same part of the tune. Now this repetition doesn't mean that the soloist is lame or boring, but more about their ability to create multiple variations from one 
concept, and that's really the fundamental skill that great improvisers have. It's not about mastering a million licks and trying to randomly string them together in different orders, but how deeply do you know what you know and how many variations can you create out of a few simple concepts. So the first concept I want to show you that's really prevalent in Henryzen's playing is the use of digital patterns. And by digits I'm talking about our fingers, not the ones and zeros from computer language. Digital patterns are one of the most common tricks in all of string playing, not just for beginning improvisers, but even for the most advanced players like Stefan Grappelli or Jean-Luc Ponty, who have tons of these types of patterns uh, built into their musical vocabulary. A digital pattern can literally be any group of two or three fingers in a repetitive fingering going up or down the fingerboard. Here's an example of Henryzen using it uh, in bar 42. He plays. So notice our pattern here. 014 and then 014. He's grouping the notes in triplets. And because it's a three note grouping, if he were to play a longer phrase like 014, 014, 014, it might start to sound a little bit obvious. You see, whenever we're playing any type of pattern-based lines, we want to be slick enough that it's not too patterny or obvious sounding to the audience. And this is something that Henryzen is really, really good at. So in bar 25, leading up to the second bridge, Henryzen plays this. And I'll slow it down for you. So notice what's happening here. We have O one three, O one three, O one three, O until he breaks the pattern at the very end to arrive on the downbeat of the bridge. Now, notice that this is a three note grouping, O one three. But to spice things up, he's playing it as a standard eighth note pattern where two, or you can think four notes, are generally grouped together. And what that's doing is, is it's phasing this three note pattern over the beat or over the bar line to create something that's a little bit more interesting. And to spice it up even more, he bows it in groups of two as well. Check it out. Slur, 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 slur. And that even further creates this sense of rhythmic floatiness, this rhythmic distortion that's happening. So that is an excellent and obvious way to use gr rhythmic groupings to spice things up. Another cool trick Henryzen uses with rhythm is at bar 26, where he changes speed in the middle of the pattern. So this pattern is 310 and we're going down this time. But to make it interesting here, he starts with 16th notes and then turns it into triplet 16th notes, like this. One E and a, uh, and then triple la, triple la. One E and a. Uh, In the next section, building up to bar 90, Henryzen disguises the digital pattern by using the first note as a pickup note, slightly slower than the pattern that ensues. I'll play it on the slow side, like this. Again. Again, what we have here is just 013, the same digital pattern he used before, but what he's doing is, is taking that first open string, or in this case, thumb, and using it as a slower 16th note pickup. One. You could also think of this as an example, like the previous one, as a subtle change of speed. And that really, really spices up what would otherwise be a fairly dull sounding passage. Another simple but effective approach that Henryzen uses in bar 50 is the use of repeating a note. And what 
we have is, is just two and three. But he repeats the second finger. This is actually a really effective digital pattern for the minor pentatonic scale. He also lengthens the first note, which is kind of interesting, because now we're dealing with groupings of two fingers that are playing three notes that are four eighth notes long, like this. One. Another great strategy Henryson uses is to lop off or to add a note to the pattern at the beginning or the end. This is a really, really effective concept because it can throw off the beat placement and rhythmic groupings and make the listener second guess if he's really hearing a repetitive pattern or not. Check out measure 74. Now in this case we have a really cool digital pattern of one, two, thumb. So it kind of has a less predictable shape than the other patterns that he's been playing so far. But notice the first time he plays the pattern on the A string, he leaves out the thumb, playing only two notes there, and then going whole hog on the pattern as he descends down the lower strings. Then... Starting the lick this way really throws off the listener as we're being fooled into thinking that we're going to have a very regular pattern. Then we'd expect to hear... Right? But instead... We go into these groups of the three, which gives us that kind of swimmy feeling grouped in eighth notes like this. Another great example is in bar 102, where Henryson does the same trick, but in reverse. We basically have a two-finger digital pattern, three and thumb. And then he adds a note. Again. So in this case, he's starting with a two-note grouping and adding a pattern of three right at the very end to get him out of the pattern. This is also very cool and equally effective. And Ryzen uses these digital patterns all over the place in this solo, but he definitely and always uses them right before the bridge. And this makes sense because the bridge is where the chords change, so it's de facto the high point or the highest energy point uh, of the tune. And so having a pattern that swoops up the fingerboard and doesn't require a lot of thinking is a really, really advantageous thing here. So let's take that part of the tune, and I'm just going to put on a background track here, and we're going to use, say, the two bars going into the bridge, where, with the exception of the first chorus, and rise and use a digital pattern every single time, um, and we're going to use that section of the tune on loop to practice some of the same concepts we were just talking about. So let's start with a basic digital pattern, like this. And I'll just stay in first position to keep things really simple. So 1, 3, 0. Oh. And just to make things a little bit different from Henry and to challenge myself, I'm going to try descending instead of ascending. He's usually going up to try to hit a high note uh, at the high point of the bridge, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, but I'm going to go down. I'm going to descend. And here's what the absolute stock version of that might sound like. I might consider using that, but now let's focus on trying to create a few variations using the techniques that 
we saw and heard Henryzen use in his solo. In other words, our purpose here isn't to steal Henryzen's exact patterns or licks, uh, but to steal the ideas and concepts behind them. The first thing that we could do is we could change the rhythmic groupings. Now this particular pattern, I played it in triplets before because it's a group of three notes. One, two, three. But what if we made it eighth note? So now you have fingering groups of three, but in rhythmic groups of two. We could also spice this up even more by using a pickup note and not starting on the downbeat, which can be a little bit lame. So that could sound like this. Again, one and. Pretty cool. We could also try lengthening one of the notes of each group so that they're not all the exact same rhythmic duration. Just to keep things simple, I'll do that with the first note. So I'll play quarter, eighth, eighth. Or I could do that with 16th notes. Making it twice as fast. The effect is still the same, adding just a little bit of spice to an otherwise dull sounding pattern. Now let's try Henryzen's technique of leaving off a note at the beginning of the pattern. Now let's reverse that and leave off a note at the bottom of our pattern. Something like this. And there we have it. It's good to notice that when playing digital patterns in this context, getting all of the right notes from the key is really optional. In other words, these patterns have their own internal logic, their own melodic gravity, if you will. And because they tend to pass by quickly and are used for the purpose of building tension, we don't really have to think very much about playing all of the right notes as we fly up or down our fingerboard. This can be especially helpful in a context like this where we're really using these digital patterns to build up to and build tension towards a resolution note. That is the first intermelody note of our bridge. And as long as we know where that is, everything else in between can just happen on its own. This can almost feel like a mental break when we're improvising, simply waiting for the next important note that we're going to arrive on. Now let's talk about Henryzen's approach to the bridge. Hey there. Sorry to bother you, but if you've come this far into the video, you probably started to realize that this isn't the same old rote repetition teaching or recycled general theory that you could find anywhere else. And that's why I hope that you'll join me for the rest of this lesson and so much more on my website, The Improviser's Guide to the Cello. This is the first substantive, well-sequenced approach to learning how to improvise on the cello. And it's a breakthrough that answers a lot of the most important questions and issues that all cellists face, no matter what style you're trying to improvise in. For less than the cost of a private lesson with some fancy teacher in your town, you can have my life's work for an entire year. So what are you waiting for? Come join our community at theimprovisersguide.com, and I'll see you there.